Greetings, Internet, and welcome back to Insane Ian Taste Tests. This is also a Q&A video. Uh, basically, this episode is going to serve as the finale for Insane Ian Taste Tests, as well as a Q&A video that I mentioned online that I was going to do. Basically, I, I said in the previous episodes of Insane Ian Taste Tests, I would explain why there had been such a delay with the episodes, and what was taking so long, and what was happening, and I never did. And now it's almost eight months, ten months later. So, here we go. In March, I filmed the last two episodes that were seen, uh, at MarsCon, which is a science fiction convention in Minneapolis that I was a musical guest performer at, uh, with a bunch of people who showed up in those videos. And after I got back home from that, I got kidney stones. This is the third time in my life that I had kidney stones. Uh, it seems like every four years I get kidney stones, which is super great. Basically, uh, I, I've had to change my diet a lot and uh, kind of reduce the things that I do. And two of the biggest causes of the kidney stones in me were sugary sodas and chocolate, and two of the things I do the most on the show were sugary sodas and chocolate. So I had to put the kibosh on the show. I had a stack of food waiting to be had, had reviews for. I had the Peeps flavored Oreos. I had the pancakes and syrup flavored Peeps. They obviously were going to go together. It was a Easter thing. Easter was coming up when I came back, but then I got the stones and wasn't able to do it. Um, I had a, a fish chocolate bar that uh, I never got to. And then uh, at Fump Fest, while I, was st while I still had kidney stones, I had kidney stones for three months because I, I couldn't get the surgery to remove it. It, wasn't, it was too big for me to pass. Um, at at Fump Fest, somebody gave me some tuna cans of, like, tuna salad, and I never got to, around to those. We'll get to that in a minute. But, all that said, I have one final thing that I can do, that I'm going to do, in this finale, and that is the Super Mario Cereal. I'm very excited for this. This is kind of a rare thing. Uh, it's, it's out occasionally, and it comes with an amiibo for the Super Mario Odyssey game, which is neat. It's like the old school uh, cereals. tyson has got games and stuff, and you put your controller on that, and it, something unlocks in the game, so that's neat. But it's a sugary cereal, and it smells amazing. It smells heavenly, and all that is the marshmallows. I didn't say I cut sugar completely out. I'm just doing less sugar. So, let's do some less sugar. Oh, those sugary bits just look amazing. These marshmallows and star shapes. I don't know what the marshmallows are. I guess that's supposed to be a toad head or a mushroom head. And this is supposed to be... It's not clear what any of these are supposed to be. They, you can't even tell on the box. The only one you can tell on the box is the question mark block, and that does not look like a question mark block. There's no way they can keep that conformity. You want to roll the bag back so it stays fresh, because clearly this is something I'm going to be eating every morning. And then, uh, you know, you have to have milk on your cereal, unless you're Kylie Jenner. I'm lactose intolerant, so it's lactate milk. Changing that diet. Yeah, buddy. So let's give this a healthy spoonful. Got some marshmallows and some crunchies on there. It's nothing spectacular. It tastes like cereal with marshmallows in it. If you've had cereal with marshmallows in it in the past 20 years, like your, your Lucky Charms or your anything with grain bits and your marshmallow sugar stuff, it's it's exactly the same. It does smell amazingly sugary when you pour the, the milk on it. It smelled sugary before, but somehow the milk amplifies it. It's amazing. It's pretty good. It's not going to blow your mind or anything. It serves its purpose. The marshmallows look like mushrooms, and the green ones do. And the other shapes are just there. 
So we've gotten the taste of stuff out of the way. So now we're going to get into the Q&A portion of the video. I posted on Twitter, on Facebook, and on my Patreon page asking for questions for me to answer in a Q&A video. I did one of these a couple months ago, and I'm doing another one now. Got a lot more questions this time because, for whatever reason, on my Twitter page, which is at InsaneIanB, my Facebook page, which is Facebook.com slash InsaneIanMusic, I don't get a lot of responses. I have a, a lot of fans who follow me and stuff like that, and, and not a lot of responses. Most of the questions for this I got were on my personal page, as opposed to, to the, the page for my, my music and stuff, so that's where a lot of these came from. I did get some on Instagram from the last video that I didn't see until now, so I'm asking those too, so let's just jump into it. Okay, so... First question comes from Wacky Ben of uh, Wackiness on the Rise, which is a comedy music podcast that you should check out. Uh, Wacky Ben writes, where did the name Insane Ian come from? That story is kind of twofold. I've told it on a couple different podcasts, but you know, you asked the question and I never answered it for you. You clearly didn't hear those shows, so we're putting it in a video. I've had the name Insane Ian since high school. I am almost 40 years old now, so this is... 20 years ago. When I was in high school, we had, we called it a coffee house, but it was basically just people playing music in the library. I went to a very small Catholic high school. I'm not even Catholic, I just went to a Catholic high school. And I was telling my physics teacher about what I was doing in the, in the coffee house. I was planning on doing song parodies because Weird Al was a big thing. So I had already, already been making uh, tapes for my friends of a collection of songs from the Dr. Demento show and comedy music that I heard and making it on a tape that I was hosting. And I was a fan of the Dr. Demento show, so I liked the alliteration in the names, like Whimsical Will and Beefalo Bill and Musical Mike, stuff like that. So I went with Insane Ian and because it had the alliteration, and it was also kind of an homage to Weird Al. And then when I told my high school physics teacher about what I was doing for the music for the coffee house, he said, that's insane, Ian. And I went, you know, that really should just be my name. That should really, insane Ian. I, I did insane Ian only for a whimsical will type sketch on those tapes, but then for the song parodies, I went, yeah, you know what? Insane Ian is perfect. It's a Weird Al thing. It's a Dr. Demento thing. That's where it came from. So it was kind of given to me by my high school physics uh, teacher, but I also kind of already had the name a little bit. And then the first release I did as Insane Ian was for the first Weird Al tribute album called Prosthetic Lips. And I released uh, the only song on there that's not a song. It's the only track on there that is actually a spoken word track. And it's, I use uh, 54 different Weird Al song titles and album titles in a story, which uh, in the title of the story and the story itself, and 54 is just 27 twice for you Weird Al fans. Uh, and that was the first release by Insane Ian. That was actually as Insane Ian Bonds, where my name, uh, Insane Ian, is in quotes, and my last name is part of it, as an homage to Weird Al Yankovic, because Weird Al is in the quotes and Yankovic is his last name. After that, I, I eliminated the quote marks, I eliminated the last name from the stage name because I thought that's clearly too much hero worship so let's take that out so I, I changed it from that and that's that's where the name insane Ian ultimately came from next question before the next question I've gone back to this it does not hold it up its crunchiness in the milk it's a little soggy so from there we're gonna go to Instagram and uh, tallish boy tallish underscore B-O-I asks, when did you start rapping? When I was in Baltimore, I had been writing Insane Ian songs in high school and a little bit in college. My first band in college, I was doing stand-up at the time, I was doing a little bit of improv at the time, and I also had a comedy band. And I had been writing as Insane Ian for a little bit, and then that band kind of ended, and I kind of started another band, and then me and my buddy Wes, Wes was very into hip-hop. Loved the Beastie Boys, loved Sage Francis, and I really wanted to try a hip-hop thing. Thing. And he had written this poem called Head Trauma. And it was just a poem. And he said, I want to turn this into a rap song. And I went, okay, cool. Let me write the hook for it. The, the phrase head trauma did not appear in the song at all. It did not appear in the poem. It was just the title of it. I'm not going to tell you what the song's about. You can listen to it. It's on my Bandcamp page, which I'll put a link to here. But it's a lot more adult than most material that I do. All of that uh, early stuff uh, that we did is a lot more adult. We were in college and we thought, oh, doing this stuff's cool. Ah. 
But I added the hook about head trauma to make it fit the song, and we played it for some friends of ours in college, and they loved it. So we decided to uh, write some songs. I am misremembering that, however, because head trauma is technically the second song we did. Wes and I were messing around with my four-track recorder, and uh, it was four-track cassette recorder. That's how early these songs were. Nothing was, we hadn't started doing stuff in the computer yet, although he was taking my four-track recorder, tape recorder, and putting it in his computer. So it became the, the beginning of recording on PCs or, or computers, uh, Mac and PC, whatever, recording on to digital. And we did a song where we realized the raps we wrote were terrible. And uh, we had started this band and we called it Lung Butter. And the first song we wrote was called WSS, which stood for World song. And so that that was the first rap that we started and we went, hey, we, this is fun, let's do this. And so we did head drama because he had that poem. And then our friends listened to it and they really liked it. They really liked head trauma. They liked the hook. They liked every how everything sounded. So we did a couple more songs. So my first time rapping was around 2000, 2001, uh, when Wes and I were doing stuff that became Pudding Capacity because we we're putting stuff on mp3.com, because that was a website where a lot of bands started uploading digital songs, and we realized there were 15 bands called Lung Butter. So we changed our name to uh, Pudding Capacity, and uh, there's a whole story with that name, too. All of my band names that I had in college, I always had like seven different bands in college, and they all had really weird names, and there's a story for every single one of them. So Pudding Capacity was that band, uh, and there's a collection of Pudding Capacity songs on my band camp, if you're interested in checking that out. Sam Polkinghorne asked on Instagram, when you do originals, what comes first, the music or the words? Usually it's probably the music that comes first, if not how the music sounds, but at least the idea of what the music will be. Usually when I work with my producer Ben, Ben Stahl, he and I hash out ideas together and, you know, I'm writing lyrics while he's writing the music at the same time, so we're making them fit together on the originals. That happens That happens a lot. It doesn't happen the same way every time, though. It, it becomes difficult because if I have the music completely done before I have the lyrics done, then I have to try to fit the lyrics to it, which is different than parody. Because parody, you already know how the lyrics fit into that music. The lyrics are already a thing. So you're just putting your lyrics where those lyrics go because you know how they're singing that song. If I have the music for a song and that doesn't have any lyrics at all that nobody's written any lyrics for, it's somehow di more difficult for me to write lyrics to? I've got two songs right now where that's a thing. I've got an original song for, for my my next album, and then I've got a collaboration that I'm doing with somebody. Uh, Rhythm Bastard has uh, sent me uh, a song to do, and I just was having so much trouble writing to his music because I'm like, I don't know how it's supposed to be sung. And also, it, the topic is a little tricky for me, too. Basically, as soon as I have a, a proper idea structure, then technically the music and lyrics kind of happen at the same time. Is basically, I what took a really long trip to say that. Moving on to the next question. On Patreon, I only had one question when I posed this on Patreon, and that came from Jason Youngbird, and I said I'd get to this. How was that salmon salad I gave you last Fumpfest? That's the unfortunate thing. Jason gave it to me at, at Fumpfest. Give me the two different, like it was one as a tuna salad, one was a salmon salad. Two different salads in, in a tin can that were supposed to last for a while. I unfortunately did not get a chance to, to even eat it because it had been sitting here for so long. It is October when I'm recording this, and I threw them out last month because because they had been sitting here so long and I never got around to making the video. I had been sick for three months and then everything else was happening and I just didn't get to them. I'm sorry. Thank you so much for the lovely gift of a taste test thing. I'm sorry I didn't get to it. Uh, Angela, I'm sorry I didn't get to your fish chocolate bar. They just sat here for so long it, they went bad. So I wasn't able to do it uh, because I was sick and then couldn't get to it after I was well again. So I'm sorry, but thank you again for providing them for what should have been a video and just ultimately was not. Mad Mike Buechler writes, A train leaves the station at 1 p.m., accelerating at one kilometer per hour a minute. There's already a problem with this. A second train leaves the station 30 minutes later, traveling at a flat 60 kilometers per hour. The first train is carrying 500 kiloliters nitric acid, and the second is full of 500 kiloliters glycerin. How far away is the explosion? Bonus points for the yield and how much of it you feel in the original location. The answer is yes. If you know anything about me, I don't math. Don't. I have songs about it, uh, how much I don't math. DJ Wes K of Pudding Capacity writes, Tell us how making comedy music has changed from the 1990s to now. That answer is one word. 
YouTube. In the 90s, making comedy music was already a rarity because if you ask some other comedy musicians, the advent of grunge made everything dour and there was no room for comedy, which I don't fully subscribe to. But there definitely was a time where novelty music was too much of a novelty and comedy music wasn't as prolific in the 90s. And now, because of YouTube, there are so many parody artists, there are so many comedy musicians out there. Between YouTube having videos for all of them, or The Fump, where it's strictly audio only, and, you know, we're, we're trying to make more mu music videos for The Fump, especially me, because I'm kind of in charge of that now. So there, there's definitely the dichotomy of, of people who do audio only and people who do audio and video, specifically video for their, their comedy songs, and trying to push the, the comedy music out there a lot. There's an article that I did that I didn't realize I was going to be a part of <laughs> in Splitsider, which is owned by Vulture, which I'll have the link to in the description. It came out a couple years ago, 2015. The article is called 2015, The Year Comedy Music Broke, which is a parody of the year punk broke, uh, the title of it anyway. And uh, it's about how prevalent comedy music was in 2015. In 2015, comedy music was huge. Crazy Ex-Girlfriend started, and, you know, the Logan Awards were really huge. For me, it was really huge because that was the year I had the number one song on the Dr. Demento show for Benedict Cumberbatch, and I've been trying to get back to that point any ever since. But anyway, so that's, that's a big article. That kind of explains a little bit more of, of how big comedy music is now because you have so much of the permeation of how big YouTube is in culture now. There is no MTV anymore. MTV is what we had in the 90s. Now MTV doesn't even show music. It's not music television. You get your music videos and you get your, your, your video version of the, the songs that you like on YouTube. And that's really been the big push for comedy music nowadays. Tenacious D, their new album is a rock opera and it's was done in a movie animated style. Not really animated, it's still pictures, but they cut to a lot of still pictures, drawn by Jables, and it's now cut up into a series, chapters, on YouTube exclusively. So even even the, the modern day artists who are big, who have record labels behind them, know how big YouTube is. Weird Al's last album, Mandatory Fun, became number one on the Billboard charts, debuted at number one on the Billboard charts because of the eight videos in eight days he did just before the album came out on YouTube. He did that huge push of social media and, and everything is driven by social media and online now. That's how the big difference is between comedy music in the 90s and now. Jared Perez, Mr. Tuesday, says, you've collaborated with so many people from the comedy music world and even Chris Ballou from the Presidents of the United States of America, but who would be your dream collaboration doesn't have to be a comedy artist. There's a couple. I've always wanted to work with MC Frontalot in Nerdcore. I've always wanted to work with MC Lars and, and Mega Ran. There's a lot of Nerdcore artists I'd like to work with. I've been privileged enough to be able to work with Schaefer the Dark Lord a couple times, but Frontalot, Lars, and Mega Ran I'd really like to work with. Obviously Weird Al. I'd love to work with Weird Al on a song, although he doesn't really do collaborations a lot. I'm one of those people though who, if I want to work with somebody, I'd just ask them. I have no shame or fear of, of that. I just straight ask them, and if they say no, then they say no, and I move on. The Epic Rap Battles of History guys I'd like to work with. Not just Nice Peter and Epic Lloyd, but also Zach Sherwin. Uh, Zach Sherwin's a great comedy rapper in his own right, and he's really great. Lonely Island, because they rap and I rap, and it's a lot of the similar stuff, so that'd be really cool to collaborate with them. And uh, as far as other artists, you know, Chris Ballou is the big one, but you know, Danny Elfman from Oingo Boingo, the Johns from They Might Be Giants. You know, I'd like to work with Psycho Stick. I would love to work with uh, Danny and Brian from Ninja Sex Party. So yeah, there's there's a bunch, and I'll get to them eventually. Going on from that question, there was a, a question on Twitter. David Buck, which is Salty Asparagus One, asked on Twitter, How did you manage to get Chris Ballou involved in your song Internet Famous, and what was it like working with him? First, uh, I should say that Internet Famous is actually the second song that Chris Ballou the second song of mine that Chris Ballou is on. On my first album, Nerd Songs, there's a song called There's Something About a Zombie, which is a We Are the World style song about zombies. The movie Shaun of the Dead has Coldplay show up in it, and they're, they're doing a zombied benefit. And that's where the idea for There's Something About a Zombie came from. This is the zombied benefit song. But instead of rock stars or something, I had comedy musicians. It's 11 different comedy musicians. Oh, and Chris Ballou from the Presidents of the United States of America. How did I get him on these songs? 
I'm a huge Presidents of the United States of America fan. So huge, in fact, that when the band broke up in 1998, one of the first things I did musically ever was I produced a tribute album to the band, and I had connections on the internet of other bands, and they all submitted the songs, and I produced this record and I put it out. And it was a tribute to the band and, you know, how much the music meant to the fans. So I did the tribute album, and a couple other friends who uh, were fans, we all ran a mailing list called Froggy List, where we talked about the band and B-sides and stuff like that, and kept the conversation about the band going even after their breakup. Followed a lot of their other projects. Chris Ballou, uh left the Presidents, but he did a side project, a solo project, where he played everything called The Giraffes. And then we learned that a lot of the President songs were actually early songs that he did in other bands called Egg or Dukes of Pop or solo as his act Casper. And so we kind of kept that going. And me and Jack, this guy named Yoda, who uh, turns out his real name is Sal, and Mike Lyon all kind of ran this mailing list. And also the three of them ran chrisbaloo.net, which was a fan site. So I did the tribute album, they did the website, and the band heard about us. They learned about us keeping the songs and everything alive. And so the band knew about us, and when they got back together in 2000, to do the album Freaked Out and Small. They weren't touring or anything, but they did a, what was basically the first Kickstarter online was a website called Music Blitz. They realized that there's still an audience there and people funded the album and got their names in it. My name is in the credits in that album. So they really embraced the fans and, and loved us from that. And so because that album did so well online, they decided, yeah, let's, let's get back together and tour. So in 2002 and 2003, they got back together and toured. I never saw them on the first tour, and I saw them finally in 2002 in Roanoke. The band knew about us and were like, you guys are the super fans. You're automatically getting backstage passes. Long story short, it's a mutual admiration society. They get us backstage passes to all their shows when they perform. And I thought, well, the band knows me. Let me see if I can ask. That goes back to me asking anybody. I just asked Chris if he would do the song, and he said, yeah, I'm down. And then for Internet Famous, I was like, I'm doing what's basically an interpolation of Naked and Famous by the Presidents. Let me ask Chris if he'd be willing to sing the hook on this. And he was absolutely down. Not only was he down for singing the hook, he gave me video of him singing it for my stage video for the song. Chris Ballou pops up in that when I perform that song live. So that's neat. I just asked, basically. David also followed up with, I'm also curious to know when you first heard the Dr. Demento show and if you remember the very first song you heard on the show. I first heard the show in high school because I had first heard of the show in the Weird Al documentary The Complete Al, but I didn't know of any radio stations in my area in Baltimore that played it. And luckily in high school, somebody turned me on to the fact that 99.1 WHFS, which is a station that doesn't exist anymore, played it Sunday nights midnight to two. So I, I finally heard the, the station in about maybe 93, 94. I do not remember what the first song I heard was, but I do know I heard a lot of really great things on that show and was really excited. It was about 93 because it was around the time when Alapalooza was coming out and so they were you know in an interview with Al was coming up so I was really glad to find the show in time to hear an interview with Weird Al on the Dr. Demento show. It was just before that album came out so that was exciting but I do not remember what the first song was. Jeff Whitmire asked on Twitter what do you consider your proudest musical accomplishments thus far and be bok choy or lettuce. So in, in to answer the first part my proudest musical accomplishment so, thus far probably working with Chris Blue <laughs> getting him on that song is was was really great probably you know working with Chris Blue and getting number one on the Dr. Demento show are tied number one on Dr. De on Dr. D's show for 2015 is a badge of honor that I will never stop talking about so probably those two I have a lot of songs that I'm really proud of but as far as musical achievements probably number one on the Dr. Demento show and getting Chris Blue on a song Oh, and going back to another thing that, that Jared said, somebody else I want to work with, Perry Grip from Nerf Herder. Always, I would really like to work with Perry Grip. So if you're watching this, Perry, call me. And bok choy or lettuce? I don't know what bok choy is. I don't think I've ever had it, so probably lettuce. Eclectic Lee on Twitter asks, What's the creepiest fan interaction you've had, and was it with me? I haven't really had any creepy fan interactions. That's not an invitation for anyone to give me a creepy fan interaction, but I haven't really had any creepy fan interactions. All my fans have been really super nice, and uh, I love you all, and thank you. You know, it's all been really nice and really good, and everybody's been really friendly and, and caring and just great fans. 
So I, I'm very thankful and lucky to have any fans at all. So no no fan interaction has really been creepy. So thank you. Corey Kramer, who does the Wonder Weenies comic, which currently I am guest starring in. A drawn version of me, obviously, because it's a webcomic. Corey Kramer writes and asks, how do you decide on what to parody? Do you prefer a modern topical song or is anything game provided it lends itself to the subject matter? I do it both ways. Weird Al tends to go completely topical as far as songs that he parodies. He does songs that are number one or, or ranked really high in the top 40 pop song chart. I do that occasionally. I'll take a song from the pop song top 40 charts, listen to a lot of top 40 radio and try to find something that would be good to parody because it's popular and because it, I have a subject that matches it. Also, I worked in a music store and I liked listening to a lot of different types of music and worked at a music store, past tense. This was ages ago. So I listened to a lot of different types of music and a lot of eras of music. And so if I'm writing a song for a medley, say, or, or about a current game, I like to go obscure and sometimes make a parody of of an older song about a current game. So it's still semi-topical, but it, the song itself is older. But it's still in the pop culture awareness center. I try not to do too obscure a song. I try to make it at least something that somebody's heard of and was popular at one point. Having it re-enter the public awareness is always helpful. I have a couple songs that I'm working on that are that used to be popular that have kind of re-entered pop culture awareness. So that's kind of a big thing, as long as it's something that can be centered on that. That's why I, I don't totally focus on the, the top 40 pop stuff. I kind of bounce back and forth between those when I do do parody. Uh, what is your favorite Christmas song about serial killers? Asks Wacky Christmas Album November 2nd. That's their username on Twitter. Their handle is Giordano Xmas. So I, I, it might be a parody account uh, that does comedy music. I don't have any favorite Christmas songs about serial killers other than uh, The Night That Santa Went Crazy by Weird Al because Santa becomes a serial killer. But only at the North Pole, I, I think. I don't think he kills any kids getting gifts or anything like that. That would be really dark. So just that one, I'll say. I've never written a, a Christmas song about a serial killer. Back on Facebook, Chad Smith asks, of all the songs that you have made, what song do you like the most or would love to parody? It's kind of two different things. What song that I made would I like to parody? I don't think I would parody one of my own songs. I know other artists have. I know Carla Ulbrich has parodied What If Your Boyfriend Was Gone with What If Your Butt Was Gone, but I don't think I would parody one of my own songs. But what song do I like the most? It's tough. Uh, I'd probably say of the songs I've done recently, usually it's, if it's a song that I've done recently, I, I'm, I'm really proud of it. And the, the most recent song I've done is I Don't Get It with Beefy on Vince Vandal's Friends and Fandoms 2, which is available now and li link here. So probably that. Usually it's a it's a free it's a recent song. I'm also really proud of a lot of stuff that I've done before. Uh, obviously Benedict Cumberbatch because it was number one on Doctor D. I'm really proud of that song and Rules of the Road, the Meatloaf pastiche. I'm really proud of that song. And only now, four years later after that album came out, that song is finally getting some fan recognition. I I've had a couple people out of the blue come and come up to me and say, "Wait, I've heard this Meatloaf pastiche that you did and it's amazing." So I'm really kind of happy that that's getting recognition now four years later. <laughs> Jeff Whitmire, who loves that song, asked, If you were a Twinkie, what would you be filled with? Love. Corey asks, How much wood could a woodchuck chuck if a woodchuck could chuck wood? That's a question that everybody knows the answer to. The answer is 37. My friend Faith asks, How to pump gas? I'm answering this one seriously. I know in New Jersey, there are no self-serve gas pumping stations. You, Keek, you can't do it. It's against the law to pump your own gas in New Jersey. They're all full service. They all have attendants who come out to pump the gas for you. You stay in your car. In other states, that's not a thing. And some people don't know how to pump your own gas. It's really easy. First, turn your car off. Do not leave your car running while you're pumping your gas. No, don't do it. Turn your car off. It's parked in front of the pump. You open the pump uh, door. You uh, do the unscrew. You undo the door and you undo the doohickey cap. It's called the gas cap. Take the gas cap off. You select the grade of gasoline. If your car is one of the newer cars and it kind of needs premium, it needs the higher octane stuff, generally that can be bullshit. If it operates better on that shore, but honestly, the lower octanes are fine. You can use the lower octanes if it's, it's whatever. You take the pump and you place it into the gas hole, the gas hole. That's what I'm calling it. I'm calling it the gas hole. And then you make sure that it is as far in as it can go. Don't let it hang out a little bit. Make sure it's in there. And then you squeeze the trigger on it 
to pump. Now you can sit there and you can hold it if you want, or it's got that little flap doohickey on the bottom of it that you can wedge under to keep it pumping while you can let go of the pump. And you just let it fill. Honestly, it's gonna rank up the money depending on how much dollars per gallon gas is. You do whatever is right for you. If you wanna stop at five bucks, you can just sit there, hold it, and wait for it to fill up to five bucks and then let go of the trigger. Don't let go of the whole pump, let go of the trigger so it stops. Or you can let it fill all the way up, and if you have it so it's holding the trigger down, if it fills up, there's a sensor in the pump that will sense that the tank is full and it will undo that trigger automatically and it will stop. The pump will stop. I should also say some pumps are not all the same. Sometimes you can't just pull the pump off and start pumping. Sometimes you have to lift up a flap or push down a flap. You always need to select your grade first, select your octane, you hit the button for that, and flip up something or flip down something. All pumps are different, but there is that. So, when you're done pumping, this is the important thing, and this is kind of what why they have it be full service in New Jersey. You wanna make sure you don't drip. You wanna make sure that there is no spills. So you release the trigger, and then you angle the pump up to make sure any drips go in the tank. You make sure that anything that's there goes into your tank so that you don't drip or leak anywhere. And then you slowly remove that from there. You push the thing down or whatever, move the flap, whatever it is, to put the pump back on the hook. Replace your gas cap and close the gas door because otherwise you're driving down the highway and it looks stupid. And that's it. That's all you need to do to pump your gas. It's really not that complicated. You take the pump, you put the pump in, you squeeze the pump, you let go of the pump, you make sure you don't drip and you put it back. The end. Hope that helped you, Faith. Casey Jones asks, how do they make glue from horse hooves? I'm gonna guess a blender. Craig Marks of Power Salad asks, who's Harry Crumb? According to IMDB, it's John Candy. Sulfur asks, where the hell is my cell phone? Did you check your pockets? Tim of D&D Sluggers asks, where's a place outside of North America you would like to perform? Anywhere outside of North America. New Zealand, I'd love to perform in New Zealand. I kinda wanna perform in Australia, but, but the wildlife there scares me. I don't like spiders, and there's big spiders in Australia, so that kind of meh. Uh, Canada, I love Canada. England would be really cool. But overall, you know, just that's all I can think of right now. I don't know of any places overseas that would want me. He follows that up with, are Crocs actually bad shoes? I don't think so. They don't look great. They kind of look, eh. But if they're comfortable, who cares? If you're comfortable wearing them, wear them. You be, do you. That's great. And then we get into the weird stuff because Shoebox of Worm Quartet found the thread and started asking questions. Shoebox writes, As a lactose intolerant American, do you feel marginalized in this dairy happy world where everybody seems to want to put cheese in, on, or around, or upside goddamn everything? I don't say I would mean think I'm marginalized, but it is tougher to eat things now because I have to ask for it without the cheese on it, and a lot of things are very cheese. I'm lucky in my lactose intolerance in that only certain types of cheese affect me. If it's a mozzarella or a, or a low dairy kind of cheese, I'm okay with it. It doesn't bother me. Or not a low dairy, but a low lactose. If it's a low lactose cheese like that, I eat string cheese mainly because my calcium is low. That's why I drink lactose-free milk too. I, one of the things with the kidney stones is I need to bring my calcium up because it's always low and the oxalate has nothing to adhere to. So now I need to get more calcium in my diet again because lactose intolerance kind of led to my <laughs> kidney stones in previous years. So no, it's it, I don't feel marginalized. I just wish everything didn't have cheese on it all the time. But I still end up eating things with cheese anyway because I'm a rebel and you can't stop me. Although the gas pain can stop me. It's painful. He also asks, also, who was the first person you ever killed? I'm not answering that because that would be incriminating. There are a couple people who asked meme questions. I'm not I'm not answering those. Shoebox asked again, if you could nail any of the chipmunks to Paul Dini, why would you choose Theodore? Because Theodore has no uh, surface to nail on. Because Alvin's short and Simon's tall, Theodore's wide. So you could you cover more surface area on Paul Dini with Theodore. That sounded fine. Ordo of the Courtesan and the Cabin Boy asks, what's your superhero origin story? Were you bitten by a radioactive Dr. Demento? What changes in your origin story when they make the gritty reboot? My origin story is that I am the son of parents who were in a filk group. 
sci-fi music. So I, I came about doing nerd music kind of naturally as a second generation nerd musician. What changes in my origin story when they do the gritty reboot? The parents die because all superheroes have to have orphan parents. I don't want that. My parents are both alive and well and I'd like them to continue that way. But that would be how they change it in the reboot. Justin Hartley from the player characters writes, If a small horde of fleas were suddenly turned giant and we discovered that all fleas bared a slight resemblance to Sam Kinison on hopping stilts, what brand of root beer would you use to make a root beer float? Uh, IBC root beer. Uh, it's, it's probably my favorite. Sprecher's is really good too, but probably IBC. I have a very big preference to IBC. I drank that a lot growing up, so. Adam Tabor asks, does your real name have any literary reference? For those of you who don't know, who only know me as Insane Ian, my real name, my birth name is Ian Bonds. And yes, there is a literary reference. My last name is Bonds. Rumor has it that my family changed my last name. It used to be Bond and they added an S. We're not sure how true that story is, but that's the rumor. And so of course, James Bond was written by Ian Fleming. So yes, I am Ian Bonds. There's your literary reference. Yes, my parents were very aware of that when they named me that. My dad had all the old Ian Fleming books and was a big fan. So yes, that's the literary reference with my name. Shoebox returns with another question. Oh goody. Who stole more cakes? Jesse Eisenberg or Gene Hackman? The answer is Michael Rosenbaum. I'm not explaining any of that. If anybody out there gets that, good on you, but I'm I'm not explaining a word of it. Twill Distilled of Wreck the System writes, who slash what originally inspired you to become a performer? She also asks, how did you get your stage name? But I answered that at the beginning of this video. Who or what originally inspired me to become a performer? My parents. My parents inspired me because, like I said, uh, they were in a filth group. They were the group called the Omicron SETI 3, and they would perform at conventions across the United States and Canada, I think, too. And uh, I, one of my earliest memories, I'm about five years old, and my parents are performing at a con in New York, and in the front row of that convention is Isaac Asimov, and he's singing along to my parents' song. So that was kind of my, my first idea of, of being a performer, was watching them perform. My dad also ran a community theater <clears throat> in Baltimore, where I'm from. He was the managing director and the artistic director of Harbor Theater in Baltimore. And so I was with him when he was at the theater all the time, and that kind of gave me the bug to be an actor. So I, I've done a lot of plays and stuff because of, of watching him do that. And I kind of got the performance bug from a lot of that, and in high school and college started doing stand-up and improv and stuff, and all of that kind of gave way to being what Insane Ian is now today. How did I get my stage name? I answered that with, with Ben's question. Rhythm Bastard writes, what makes a song catch your attention with regards to whether or not to parody it? I sort of also answered this one. A, it has to be a catchy song. B, it has to be a song I like. I can't parody a song that I don't like. Because otherwise, the way I write a parody, I have to listen to that song over and over again to kind of figure out what kind of rhyme scheme I'm working with, how they do the rhyme scheme, what's going on with my lyrics versus their lyrics, am I going to reference their lyrics a little bit, and if it's a song that I can't stand, I'm, I'm not going to have any fun writing that song, and it's going to suffer for it. Popular songs and songs that are not just popular, but that I personally enjoy listening to. And then for the final question, Vince Vandal, who I mentioned with his album uh, Friends and Fandoms 2, which I'm on, writes, Why won't you shut up despite our constant insistence? Very rude, sir. Well, especially in this video, because this is super long now, I guess I will shut up. Thank you, everybody. That's been this uh, Q&A session and the finale of Insane Ian Taste Tests. I'm going to go shut up now, because otherwise I'm losing the voice anyway. Goodbye. A soggy mush. Ugh. But it still smells sugary. Wow. Shut up, Ian! What I say to me? Foot so far in my mouth that I choke on my knee! Shut up!